the last talk on this session, and I think it dovetails really nicely with this morning on communication. One of the slides shown in the first presentation comparing education and communication I thought was really revealing, and I had reflected on that as well. I'm about to teach Climate Change 101. I have 140 students. I get a whole semester with them. <laughs> if they don't get climate change the first lecture, they better get it by the last one. And I have all the power because I give them the grade. So they have a very strong incentive <laughs> to learn this stuff. And so I think it's a really powerful av avenue to have a really productive conversation with a lot of people who don't do science. This is a class for non-majors. This is also the first time I've taught this, so I'm, I'm looking for ideas. So if you have some, please let me know. So along that vein, I reflected a little bit about what got me into science and continuing along this theme of 25 years. So I was an undergraduate major in geology and economics. I went to, to Brown University to do economics and international studies. My parents are both geologists. They said, we won't pay for your college education unless you take one class in geology, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> It was a non-majors class. It was taught by Jim Head, who's a planetary geologist, who talked a lot about CO2 on Venus and Mars, greenhouse effect. And this was probably all of the climate science I got as an undergraduate. I mean, I got some in geology, but the focus was quite different, actually, at that time. And things have shifted at Brown now, actually. There's an uh, undergraduate majors class on climate. There's a non-majors class, not about the whole solar system, just about climate. And I wondered if that was something that was common across many universities. So I just started asking. I sent an email to a bunch of people I know in secondary education. And if you have more data for me, I, I want this data. So here, I'm going to give you a couple of multiple choice questions. And I'm curious to see where you think people fell. So the first question, in what year did your university start a non-majors undergraduate class specifically directed at climate science, including a substantial treatment on projected and recent climate change. So I already told you, um, Brown didn't have one when I was there, I'm class of 99. Uh, they started one in 2012. How do you think other universities in the U.S. fall into this spectrum? What's the most common answer? Most common for Illinois, we started it in 1990. Illinois was one of the ones I got information. B. So if you have more data to add to this, please let me know. I would say that if you just focus on the US, perhaps the is the answer. But if you include many low and middle income countries, E. E. So that's interesting. This is U.S. institutions, and I just got 10 responses to my email. Most of them were started in the 2000s. There were a couple that went back further. The furthest back was Ohio State. So um, Dave Bromwich told me that class had been taught ever since he's been there. Question two. How many students typically enroll in these classes in a given semester? You can shout out your answers. Or C. 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 More than 200. Numbers on the rise. This is one of the reasons I think these classes are starting to be offered, because there's some popular demand from non-majors, <coughs> science students, non-majors, who want, who want this information. So I, I'm interested in continuing to fill this out, but I thought it was an interesting backdrop to me going into teaching my first class on this topic. I don't think this is going to go away. And I think in terms of a climate change issue, an education communication issue, this is an interesting one to focus on. Again, you have the whole semester to talk to these guys. But these classes are big, right? 200 people. Here's a little data. See you. This is this class I'm teaching, 1060. 140 students enrolled. One professor, that's me. I'm one of these ones that never got any training in education. <laughs> Expected to perform as a tenure track assistant professor. So I care about this, but I got to care about some other things as well. I get one teaching assistant who's also someone who's never had any training in education and is a first year PhD student. So, you know, also lots of other competition on the time. Two learning assistants who are undergraduates who've taken this class in the past and done well in it. So they're definitely an asset. The instructional methods used, we have two lectures a week. I'm gonna use clicker questions. How many of you know about clicker questions? How many of you use them when you were an undergraduate? <laughs> one. We didn't have clickers yeah. in those days. What, what about one-minute papers? Have you guys heard of those? Yeah. 
You're going to do one of those at the end of this, so if you haven't heard of them. One minute papers. I yeah. Know. That's great. Okay. <laughs> one minute paper. So actually, this is actually something I want you to do, and I'm going to use it on my first day of class. So I, this one minute paper, the idea here is that, you know, in your computer or on a piece of paper, something you can eventually send to me, I want you to take a minute and tell me what you would tell a student non taking a non-majors course on climate science. There's 140 of them. And I'm going to give you some of my precious time because I think it's an important thing to reflect on and I think it'd be a nice thing for us to have at the 25-year Aspen Global Climate Change Institute. My first time here, but I think a good thing to have. So, and yeah. you can use paper or a writing instrument? Like that's paper. Paper. <laughs> oh yeah, so I need a timekeeper. Yeah. What do you want to tell the student? Maybe I'll give you two minutes. No, no, you get two minutes. Two minutes. Just because you're unfamiliar with the concept, so I want you to. Spend 15 seconds so far. All right, so close it there. And if you actually do want me to convey that to a first year student, you can send it to me. I know some of you are also professors, so maybe you have this opportunity on your own. The last thing we're gonna do is another thing that I think I'll do in my class a lot, which is a clicker question. And uh, the way the clicker question works is it's a multiple choice question, and uh, you have a large lecture hall of students, and you ask it the first time. And what you do is you ask every student to commit to an answer individually on their own. So, when would you bring up politics and policy in a large non-majors class on climate science? A, B, C, or D. So commit to an answer on your own. Everybody have an answer? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, now I want you to talk to the person sitting next to you. <laughs> Groups of threes, actually. <laughs> All right, so 15 seconds, so wrap up your, your talking. And how am I doing on time overall? Oh, 11 minutes. Yeah, oh, 11 minutes in. Oh, so. Oh, good. So we do have some time. So there's this loop that you do, right? So first question, just show of hands. Did anybody change their mind after talking to people? Yes. No. Oh. Sorry. Yes, too. All right. Interesting. So how did you guys come up with show of hands here? How many said A? How many said B? How many said C? Whoa. <laughs> How many said D? Yeah. All right, the Ds, can you explain yourself? What, what did you do? <laughs> 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 Having taught large introductory classes at the University of Colorado, I recognize, of course, the intimacy or connection between the science and policy. I think it's really important. There are some, there's some realism in regards to what you can possibly do. You can assert that this is an important intimate connection, and what I would do is choose a couple of topics where it's especially evident that that's the case, and illustrate those in the context of the science conceptual learning, and then, and, and then you know, say that this is pervasive. I think that's more realistically what I would feel like I had time to do in the context of the course. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would just make the caveat that politics is very different from policy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So if, how would that change how you would answer these questions? Well, I probably wouldn't say the types of things that have been said in the tent this morning about kind of the divide between like political parties, um, but the policy in terms of the policy relevance and the policy decisions that are on the table is something that would, I think, be appropriate even at the beginning. Do you think that this would work in a lecture hall of 140 students? I that's what we discussed. I don't, <laughs> I don't think it's going to work uh, because people taking climate change class, and especially on the undergraduate level, they are not realizing the whole you know, uh, complexity of policy and climate change and environmental policy. It's definitely need to be brought uh, uh, to the attention, but these people would be taking class on climate change, climate science. Mm -hmm. Policies 
important, but uh, when I teach uh, graduate classes, and that's the only one I'm teaching, policy is like an important component, but for undergraduate, for 200 people, I don't think you'll be able to bring them up to speed if you do see. Mm -hmm. It's not what they wanted, I think. I disagree. <laughs> but I like it. I like to disagree with you. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, my question was more if you thought the clicker question would work. Because, I mean, this is actually how any kind of meaningful discussion is going to happen with 140 students. They're not all going to come to my office hours. They're busy too. Like, do you think that this works as an educational method? Yeah. Yeah, I really so, like um, peer I've used clickers at a lot of corporate events. And one of the things we've learned from that is, is that you need a, a variation responses so that you can do something with right. information. It's just a poll um, and you're going to get a, a very strong modal response and maybe this sometimes that's useful but if you get variation in responses, meaningful variation in responses, then you can draw out yeah. not why somebody's right or wrong but, but what that means. Just one thing about the politics here. Um, I think I'm a C person um, which I guess is what, <coughs> what most everybody is in the tent. I, I think that it's helpful for students to understand how policy choices or collective choices might affect outcomes. But it's also at the same time, especially with students in large classes where there might be huge variation in political background, to somehow avoid signaling early on in the class, you know, your politics or making it improper to have a skeptical view about something. And you, know, you just don't know the background of the boulder. You know, I guess you do know the background. Like some <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> but you don't know the background of the students there. And the last thing the world you want to do is polarize the audience because of your interest in talking about policy issues, and what they're going to do is mostly see you talking about ideology. Yeah, yeah I will say that just in response to this, um, I just did a tra training session on clickers, and they said if 90% of the people answer one way to kind of to move on quickly because you kind of have that consensus, but if you have, you know, half the class said A, half the class said C, you know, you can really, you have an opportunity, an educational opportunity there, and also an opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer discussions, which I think is a really useful way for them to, you know, think about why somebody, half the class, thinks something it different than them. Than you think, though, because you've got to get the responses, and then you've got to actually engage with material, so it always takes longer than people anticipate. And everyone who was at this session who used them in classes said it was one of the most effective ways that they've found to have a large class, not just have you be talking at them. They said you can't talk for more than 10 minutes before losing everyone in the room. Peer to peer quick assignments are also good for that. Yeah. We do cold calls. Cold calls. I have a gen I have a, uh, my TA generates a random list of students, yeah. and I go down the list, 15 or 20 per class, trick questions, Socratic method, so it's, so it's not just quizzes, but that surprisingly keep not surprisingly keeps people. <laughs> 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 this is great. Okay, this is this is probably not going to help you personally. But first of all, you need a lot more TAs. There should be recitation <laughs> classes. I've taught courses like this at NYU, and and you have to have recitation. And then in the recitations, it would be like labs where students and the TAs would talk about. We've just discovered a new exoplanet. It's on a G6 star or whatever it is, and it's a 0.2 astronomical units away from the star. And we've analyzed the composition of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It has so much CO2 and oxygen. Could life exist on a planet like that? Mm -hmm. And there are some simple equations that you can figure out, and you could get people in train. Secondly, Within a big lecture class like this, in between 100 and 200, I think the best model for this are the, is the old Cosmos series that Carl Sagan taught on PBS and the new Cosmos series that Neil deGrasse Tyson is teaching, or just completed teaching, I don't know if you've seen any of that, in, uh, which uses uh, stories of real scientists I mean, they, which, which do have political messages, including the importance of feminism in science and getting women to be interested in science, and at the same time teaches real scientists and, and science and has mind-blowing visuals. And, you know, we have that kind of technology available. And I think that those are the kinds of science courses 
that we need. And not to mention the fact that Tyson himself has been a terrific exponent of, of the fossil fuel greenhouse effect and its impact on climate on the various TV <coughs> shows that he goes on, including Bill Maher and a lot of PBS programs and so forth. So, so those are, you, are the things I think we should be learning from. Are you advocating that I develop that in my spare time no, this I fall, or that I use resources that are out there already that are as good as Cosmos? I mean, I think this is the real conundrum here. And if you think about the people who are teaching these large classes, that's, that's the hard question that you have to be able to ask. But you can also push, you are undoubtedly going to go to a lot of meetings at your university, wherever all this stuff is going to be hashed over. And you can push for this alternative. And eventually, as you teach the course, you'll be able to bring anecdotal material into, into these discussions yeah. based on your own experience. I wouldn't be here if I didn't care about this. And I will say that that one non-majors class I took as a freshman at Brown, it changed my life. And you know, I think that it's very possible to do the same thing for a non-major student sitting in this class. But the question of resources is a really important one and a really challenging yeah. one. And, and I would fully agree. This can be extremely important courses. We have a, in, in, at Illinois in our atmospheric sciences program, uh, we have a, uh, a general atmospheric course that covers weather and climate. And in that course, we'll track um, many hundreds. It's, it's, it's well over 1,000 every year. I don't know. It might be 2,000. Uh, and we have four or five or more TAs per semester assigned to that course. Uh, it's one overall it's instructor, but then we, we do have these these lab sessions where the, the students really get a chance to interact more. And that can be really useful in getting them excited about the science.